welcome everyone. We're going to leave the door open so as folks come in, just help them uh, get settled in next to you. Uh, I'm Steve Clift. I'm the uh, founder and executive director of eDemocracy.org. We're a nonprofit that's actually based here uh, in the Twin Cities. Um, we do a lot of work in Minneapolis and St. Paul, but also 17 or so other communities across three different countries. Uh, a little bit of work in England and New Zealand. And our session today is going to be about connecting neighbors uh, and the strategies for online engagement with inclusion. So you're going to hear a little bit about what we do in terms of our special flavor, but also as part of the description we talked about and I've seen a bit about email newsletters, a bit about Facebook pages. And I'll be honest and say that the idea is to have some basic introductions to various things. If you didn't get handouts, we'll make sure to bring you some uh, about email newsletter tips and the like. So this is going to be introduction in part. But then when we get into engagement, when we get into inclusion, it's going to be a much more in-depth um, uh, sort of exploration from our, our experience. Um, this is our summer outreach team, and Corinne Bruning with me here is our outreach manager. She'll be taking over part two of, of today. So our quick outline uh, is we're going to do a quick survey in the room, share some numbers. Uh, I'm going to present sort of some uh, basic training, if you will, on Facebook pages and email newsletters about communicating to neighbors. Um, we're going to have some small groups for a chunk. We have a, a great sized room to have groups of, of two or three uh, have some conversations and report back, uh, some of you. We're going to talk about engagement among neighbors. So, so that's the, the main two parts, is that this is two and this is among, and then we save time. Uh, we even brought our own timepiece, so we make sure that we uh, stick to it. Uh, we do have a lot of, we have a lot of webinars and other materials online that folks can look at at their own leisure. So this, this project, eDemocracy, was the world's first election information website, strictly nonpartisan nonprofit back in 1994. Uh, we have over 17,000 forum memberships across Minneapolis and St. Paul, across 40 different neighbors forums. That's roughly 10,000 people, and for those of you who are from out of town, you maybe you've sensed a little Minneapolis-St. Paul divide. Out of that 10,000 people, only 345 are on both the Minneapolis and the St. Paul forum that we host. So, um, right now the meat of our funded activity is what we call the BeNeighbors.org outreach campaign. You'll hear more about that. But that's just that's our, sort of our got milk campaign. That connecting neighbors is a good thing and we link to our stuff, we link to other people's places to connect. And just a really simple introduction <laughs> to the idea that connecting neighbors online is a, a good thing. Uh, in general, we see it being very family friendly and promote social connections. Uh, we see a lot of uh, exchange around safety and crime prevention. It unleashes the ability for neighbors to help each other. People who maybe don't know each other but live near each other. There's something about pe helping people local and being, doing things that are mutually beneficial. People like to share stuff, give stuff away to their neighbors. Uh, and a big thing for us is how then do you build that into greater voices, uh, diverse voices, into civic engagement, um, and have it actually be open and inclusive if you do it right and have that add up to stronger communities. So that's sort of our philosophy about this and we'll talk more about that. I have a quick story um, and we'll, about, this is a, a little possum there. So I live in Standish Erickson. I should first say welcome to m my home. I was actually baptized at the old Methodist church across the street. My father grew up uh, where the uh, convention center is, used to be, where the fire department is. And so uh, I was looking out the window from the, off the parking ramp, like, oh my gosh, there's a church where I was, was baptized. And, you know, and uh, so it's, it's, I'm really at home here. Um, anyway, I live in uh, the Erickson neighborhood. And so this is a post on our forum. This is actually a summary. So it's been fun and amazing to read your 20 responses to my possum photo this morning. Uh, but to, fair, to paraphrase, uh, two posts said that, that they came here in round bales from the <coughs> south, bales of hay from the south. One has been spotted in the neighborhood for a couple of years. Uh, another person talked about an article from 1948 that they shared about possums coming to Minnesota. Uh, fur traders in 34 in Mankato were getting possums. And you had this whole, like, whole community with all these folks that knew about possums in your neighborhood having a conversation about this critter right here. <laughs> uh, you had other folks that were saying, you know, they're destructive, get rid of them. Uh, but anyway, it was an example of where, uh, you know, animals brought the community together, if you will, for a real conversation. And uh, that's good enough for that story. So uh, a little quick survey. So how many of you are here from the East Coast? Uh, West Coast, a couple. Uh, south, good chunk. And how about Midwest? 
Twin Cities. So yeah, so I can get a sense of the room. Okay, how many of you uh, are employed in government? About half. How many of you are employed by a nonprofit? Um, how many of you are sort of active in a citizen group, neighborhood organization? Um, so I think it's, it's helpful for us to get a sense of the room. Uh, all right, so for those of you who are doing any kind of neighborhood facing work, uh, how many of you obviously have a website? Well, okay, all right. Uh, how many of you have a Facebook page? Twitter account? L less hands, okay. <laughs> how many of you have an email newsletter? All right, how many of you do a newsletter once a month? Uh, just, when, just when you have time. Um, okay, once a week? Once a month, that's okay. All right, and then how many of you uh, in the neighborhood, either where you live or where you work with, have a two-way online group, email list, a Facebook group? So about a third of the room, okay. So we're going to hear a lot more about that two-way stuff as part of the, today. And how many of you are, are, are work with neighborhoods where residents are creating what I call private electronic block clubs? Like, so small spaces, <laughs> Facebook groups, next door, uh, CC on email from a barbecue 10 years ago, right? Okay. So uh, how many of you would say in the areas that you work with, more than 5% of the blocks have one of those? More than 5%? More than 5% have. Okay. So obviously there's a few of us. So that one of the things we're trying to get at is sometimes there's great things that are happening, but they may be in, in relatively small areas. So uh, some people talk about, well, everybody's online now, so we don't need to talk about this. But I wanted to actually bring up some basic stats about the internet. 81% uh, of, of, of American adults are online now. 84% whites, 73% uh, African Americans, 74% Latino. There was a survey that came out that basically said that 80% of Latinos born in the United States are online, and something like 67% of those who were not born in the U.S. are online. A lot of folks in our work today for 20 years have said, well, everybody's not online, therefore we can't, we shouldn't, we shouldn't rely on the net to reach out to people. Um, at 30K or under, it's still at 67%. Now that pulls in a lot of students as well. But who's least connected, right? So, no high school diploma, there are 51% online. Over 65, 54% online. Our attitude is that if you get someone who's over 65 who's online, that's like a target audience, right? So if you've got them, they're a hub, a connector, if you will. And so rather, in our view, than say that you need more people to be online to actually do neighbor connecting, you actually want to double your efforts to reach the least connected, connected people, if you will, all right? Uh, where are people connected? Um, almost 70% at home with broadband and dial-up. Uh, so that's 65% broadband. And this, I just put other, because I, I did the math, so it's work, school, library. I don't know whether that number includes mobile only, but there's an increasing number of folks who have a smartphone, and that is their one way that they personally connect to the internet the vast majority of the time. And particularly, um, in a, a number of lower income communities as well as Latino communities, we've heard a lot, and, and African Americans, they use mobile smartphones at a higher rate than others. Um, all right. Some more numbers. 67% uh, of adults use social networking. And it's important that you're definitely going to reach more women than men. So there's a gap uh, between men and women in terms of how they use them. And Facebook is on a slight decline among younger users. Um, and uh, and, and the, the, you can dig into some surveys on that. Twitter is loved by news, news junkies, political types, uh, and also by teenagers using aliases to get outside the view of their parents. And they're, they're, uh, there was a session here yesterday uh, that had to talk about the web and how you shouldn't check geolocation when you tweet. Because you know, if you work for an association, you know, you're, maybe you're tweeting from home and you probably don't want to tie your home to your tweet about your neighborhood work or something, uh, or your government's work. Well, uh, if you, there's, some, there's some sites where you can actually look at tweets around you where the ones that are geolocated, and so you see lots of teenagers out prowling on Friday night having a good time talking to each other via Twitter. It's very instructive to look at map-based tweets to get a sense about the vibe of your community. And obviously it's often very, very different than the news and political junkies. And so you have the, but it, it is still a relatively small group. Today we're not talking about Pinterest, LinkedIn, YouTube, Reddit, Google+. You know, we can do that in the Q&A if you want to bring up some of those other tools. Uh, Couple more, more reality checks, if you will. So 88% of folks use email overall, uh, overall of, of, of net users. 58% um, on, on a typical day. Did you use it yesterday? Uh, so if you use Facebook yesterday, 48%. If you use Twitter yesterday, 8%. And what I want to point out about this is that uh, the social networking in Twitter, it's often a torrent. Like things on Twitter are fresh for about two hours. Uh, Facebook about two days. 
Think about your own use of your mailbox. Do you at least go back and look at the subject line of posts that have come in if you haven't been on email for two or three days? Most people will at least scan the subject lines in their mailbox, even if they don't open them. <laughs> and so I just want to point that out, that a lot of folks, uh, you know, and we'll talk more about email newsletters, but you know, it's really important to think about like who you're not reaching if you just rely on a torrent, if you will. Uh, now another thing, 67% of folks have visited a local, state, or federal government website. And, and that may also sort of number equate to neighborhood websites. I'm sure it would be a smaller number, but it's kind of a similar kind of destination, if you will. But on a typical day, only 13% do. So if you are these types of organizations, getting into their mailbox to tell them what's new is very strategic, if you will. Um, and so I think I've highlighted those things. My view, um, Stana Sherrickson won one of the print newsletter awards uh, yesterday, uh, my neighborhood. Uh, I'm, I'm a big believer in print for universality, so even though you're in session about online, if you want to talk to me about why not to give up print, uh, we can talk about that too. Um, there's a big study out, uh, I have a big analysis, but the thing about inclusion is that essentially those who already show up are showing up, and the person are showing up online. So basically, online politics, if you will, expressing yourself, taking action is dominated by people with higher education, higher income. Um, and while there's greater equity with uh, social media in terms of uh, income, so there's a little greater equity there than say up here, this is communicating offline, communicating online, this is social networking. Uh, these slides, by the way, are on the web, and so uh, I've already put them up, and at the end I'll share the link, so don't worry about having to write down anything you see um, on the page. Um, so my, my big piece on here is that um, if you care about equity, if you care about inclusion, if you care about having the net bring in new voices, you have to be much more intentional about it than just slapping it up there or just putting things online. Um, and our view is that neighborhoods are actually the gateway to public life. They connect people in a common interest across income, across race, across gender, across generations. And so uh, I'm trying to convince the whole civic technology world that investing in neighborhoods online is like the starting point to try to address some of these, these equity issues. There was a survey in 2010, that other one just came out last month, uh, so that 27% of adult net users, uh, or 22% overall, use digital tools to talk to their neighbors and keep informed about community issues. That was, you know, checkbox was you've emailed your neighbor or you're a member of a neighborhood email list. So that's a, that's a pretty big number. Um, and why these people are important is that 74% of those who talk digitally with their neighbors uh, also talk face to face about issues, compared to 46% overall. Okay, so a lot of the digitally engaged folks bring it face to face, and so that's, that's it's a pretty important group. Um, and then in our niche, a 7% said that they were a member of a neighborhood email list or forum. It does not include like Facebook groups because those emerged after the survey essentially. And look at this huge gap, 50K and under 3% said yes, over 75K, 15% said yes. Um, we looked at that and said, oh my gosh, there's a problem here, let's build equity. The dot com said, oh my gosh, look, rich people like these things, let's go make a lot of money. And so <laughs> essentially what's happening in the, in the commercial space is that all the investment is going toward creating services that, that serve these folks, but often very private spaces that sort of help them, you know, stay gated, if you will. Uh, and there's not a lot of investment uh, in how you connect neighbors down, you know, of all, all backgrounds. And so this, this is a, not that we're like, uh, we're in a struggle, if you will, for like how we want to shape these, these spaces. One really important thing to note is that African Americans and whites actually participate in neighborhood lists at the same level. Latinos much less. Uh, and we found generally with a Somali community work, Hmong community, a lot of the newer immigrant groups, that it's more likely that they're on the lower end for what happens organically, if you will. Uh, women down, are stronger over men in terms of participation. And our whole goal is to make more, build more equity. So um, let's check the time. How many more minutes? Are you? Where am I? Five minutes. Yeah. Seven minutes. Okay, good. <laughs> All right. So we're talking about communication right now. Uh, so disseminate information. Uh, it's one thing you can do. You can get people involved with your organization activities. And so yesterday was a good session, kind of about that, where the organization's at the center. Um, you can connect neighbors to each other, and then sort of broadly strengthen community. Uh, and then you can try to do all of this more inclusively with some st strategies and plans. Um, so email newsletters. All right. So even though you hear about Facebook pages and Twitter all the time, let me just say, cherish this access. 
cherish this access to people. If they're letting you in their mailbox, they're letting, letting you into their, their life. You're coming into their home, if you will. Um, and people, at least as I said, scan the subjects. Now the latest open rate really varies from group to group, but roughly 20% of folks uh, open it up. And uh, if you have things to click, roughly 5% will click. Um, this link here will take you to a MailChimp study, which shows big variation based on field. Um, and uh, so this is Harrison Neighborhood, a uh, very simple newsletter, in this case, uh, some imagery, and then that's just sort of what, what, what it is. It's mostly a calendar of events. And I like this. It's a date, May 16th to the 31st. You know, it comes out on a regular basis. Um, people can really rely on that, particularly if it has a, a production schedule. You've heard about MailChimp, perhaps. How many of you use MailChimp? How many of you use Constant Contact? How many of you roll your own, have your own like little BCC or whatever system? Okay. The Data Bank is also a local company here that does a mixture of fundraising tools and email lists. Um, and just for those who don't have an email newsletter, you know, don't wait for the perfect tool. BCC, right? You know, you can you can start sending an email a newsletter to 200 people. It's when you get over like three, four hundred that Google and others begin saying, "Hey, wait a minute, you shouldn't be emailing all those people at the same time." <laughs> people sometimes actually just send them in, in groups of uh, 200 at a time. Um, <coughs> BCC, not CC, just to keep things. Uh, so this is a secret technology. Uh, Karina will talk more about this as well. But um, you know, create a goal for your newsletter. Obviously, your annual meeting, other kinds of meetings, farmers markets, libraries, nationally now, and our secret sauce is door to door. But these first four are the low-hanging fruit for getting people to sign up. This is the key technology for building up an email newsletter, and you want to have this everywhere. And I actually want to pass this around the room. This actually allows you to sign up for the email e democracy newsletter if you like. You could join an online community of practice called Locals Online, which is for people interested in Locals Online. If you're really into digital inclusion, digital divide, we host the world's largest online community about digital inclusion. As an experiment, I put social media for neighborhoods Facebook group. And if you're interested in like using Facebook a little bit more, that's something I just put on there. Um, and then if you actually want training or something in your community, uh, we do fee-based type, type work. Uh, we do a lot of work with community foundations around the country. We're actually trying to get them to fund efforts in other communities to do workshops and a, a kind of a learning network. So if I know that you're interested in having that come to your community, maybe we'll go knock on the door of your community foundation to sponsor uh, five to 10 people in your community to go through a, a project together. So I'll pass this around, no pressure. <laughs> <laughs> um, a number one lesson, if you don't ask, they can't say no, right? You know, or yes, right? So you have to, asking is so important. Great resources from MailChimp, must be 30 different guidelines <coughs> uh, from, from nonprofits, different audiences. Uh, and then this is from the eBenchmark study for the nonprofit community. So they studied billions, of, what is it, uh, 1.6 billion email messages sent to 45 million subscribers. The audience of this uh, newsletter or this study was like large nonprofits like uh, Sierra Club, Red Cross, really large organizations. And they, they do a lot of email fundraising, you know, and a lot of advocacy work. But it's just important, so like they, they have a much they have a smaller open rate, 13% for ad fundraising, 14% for advocacy. And then like only uh, like less than one <laughs> that's how many people actually donate per email, right? They get more response from advocacy. But the key thing here is that for every thousand email subscribers, they have 149 Facebook fans, 53 Twitter followers. It's kind of the inverse, right? You think that, oh, you know, this would be you know, this would be a smaller number. But when, remember when with the campaign for president of Romney and Obama, <laughs> the first thing you saw on that splash screen was, give me your email address and your zip code. Yeah. There's a reason why people who want power want your email address and your zip code, because they, they now have a relationship with you. And so that, that just this is really important stuff. Um, now, as I've noticed with all the neighborhood groups that we work with in partnership, there's a new generation of staff coming in, a new generation of board members coming in who are very social media savvy. In some ways, they, they sort of look at like so the email newsletter is sort of older fashioned. And so they do want to use Facebook. They do want to experiment with Twitter. And I, I think, you know, the key for me is like having, getting that in tandem, if you will. So what's great about Facebook pages is like one of the easiest ways to share. Like people, organizations are creating fewer blogs now and simply using like Facebook page to do their regular updates. Um, you seek likes, right? And so, um, and 
typically what I've read is that they roughly two to three posts a week, sometimes more, sometimes less, but the idea is that you might have two or three tweets a day, and two or th you know, which are very pithy and short if you're using Twitter, um, and it's a different style. Um, another key lesson is to include an image, and this is, this is Harrison as well. The reason I picked Harrison was that I, I searched in Google, <coughs> neighborhood association. And Google basically said, oh, you're in Minneapolis, therefore we're going to give you some geo-personalized results. And they came up first. So that's how, why Harrison is my example here today. So they have good SEO. They have good search engine optimization. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, uh, and so it's, 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 it's interesting. You know, it's, yeah, it's, a good, it's a good way to like, do generic tests like that and kind of see what, what does Google think has happened in terms of uh, getting the word out. What they did really interestingly here is obviously here's an image, not just a PDF file, about the poster for their annual meeting. And what that does is it puts that image then on people's news streams. Um, is there any, any, actually I do have a question. So for those of you in government, uh, how many of you can still can, can access Facebook from your computer at work? How many of you can't access Facebook? So okay, so it's a little more can than can. So one of the things is, I, for those of you who work in government, how many of you are comfortable using your personal Facebook profile to do your work with the community? <coughs> And how many of you are uncomfortable with, with using your personal Facebook profile? So generally, we have the elected officials in the room that I'm well the, who said I'm comfortable because that's you know they really in fake face, but a lot of civil servants aren't comfortable using their personal Facebook profiles, and they don't Facebook apparently doesn't allow you to have a second profile for your work, and so there's a problem there. We've just kind of ding ding ding. Um, so if you're the church secretary or the work at the mosque or whatever, you're quite likely not to do what you do via email with the community. Uh, you would. On, this, on Facebook, would, that would be a, a, a barrier. Um, so, 333 likes, and, and if you click on if, you're, if you own the page, you can click on stats. It's kind of fun, they actually show some stats that are public as well. I, I'm not sure where the link is offhand. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a river going by. Uh, if two or three days after you post on Facebook, it's pretty unlikely that if someone who's not a regular Facebook user that they would see what you posted. And there's a thing called edge rank. Who's here who's heard of edge rank? It's my, probably my last question. Okay, so edge rank is how Facebook determines whether people think you're ice cream or vegetables. So basically, Facebook figures that people like ice cream, and therefore, no matter, even though they say they like it, what do they really like? And so based on your behavior on Facebook, Facebook kind of creates a record, if you will, and this big computer says, okay, how do people go in? Um, so, uh, that means that maybe only 20% or 10% or 5% of the people who like you actually will see your post in their news stream. And the more they like what you say, the more likely they are to see what you say. But I can tell you, eDemocracy has 8,000 likers for our Facebook page. We advertise on Facebook, and we end up getting all these people from India that joined. Well, they really honestly never see our stuff. And they also said to us, if you want to make sure more people see it, you can pay us to yeah. promote a post. And so. Yes, you want to be here, but if you get, if you got their email address, um, you can actually then have them sign up. And I, uh, just to finish up my part here, is that you can add an email news subscribe option on your Facebook page. So using your Facebook page, like uh, Mailchimp has a little app um, to also acquire more email addresses. That's a good one-two punch. And then using your email newsletter to actually say what you put on Facebook is also another way to drive people to engage there. I won't go into this in detail, but basically, if you want to talk about like the cheapest option for a blog, Facebook, Twitter, and all together, I have some ideas about that. Uh, the problem with that is, is if you're a one-person show, essentially, and you, you, can't, you don't have the resources to do all these, these customize, if you will, you, know, you still kind of want to get your stuff out there. If you have more resources, you want to treat, treat Twitter and Facebook differently. Pages are different than online, online groups. Facebook groups are actually quite ascendant right now. Uh, they're basically stickier and more invasive, and they basically generate a lot more email when there's under 150 members on a group. It's basically like a mailing list. When it's over 150, you, they don't tell you this, but the settings change, and you only get notices via email if your friends post. So if you've ever been on a really large Facebook group and you think, these folks all know each other at high school? Yes, they did. So on East St. Paul, you, you see these cl clicks of the folks that really know each other well participating in the public square, if you will, and a lot of it is because Facebook basically just notifies friends about what friends are doing. So it's, it's kind of a, it's a, it's a varied issue. E-Democracy is sort of a classic online group, and so we'll talk more about that. And um, there's also another model of, of Nextdoor, iNeighbors, Front Porch Forum, which are more resident-only type spaces. 
Um, and I'm all for private spaces for two or three blocks. My view is that when you cover a thousand households or more, being more public and accessible and open is really important. And you want to include, uh, like I said, the community institutions, the parks, the libraries. <coughs> all right, so we're shifting gears now from sort of organization in the center to talking more about engagement among neighbors. And Corinne's going to lead us through um, uh, a shift of this frame. Um, and let's see here. All right, I, I spoke ahead. This, it, this new Windows 8 thing, it shows me like, like the, the next slide at the same time. It's very confusing. Um, so, Corinne, I'll yeah. you. Well, thank you, Steve. Um, so we want, uh, I, when I go to conferences, I don't like to necessarily sit and listen to a talk you've had the entire time, because I start to nod off a little bit, even if it's interesting. So we want you to talk among, amongst yourself, because you, or yourselves, because you are all doing this work, and we'd love to crowdsource what you are doing so we can share that knowledge amongst us. Um, so what I'd like to do first, uh, first set of questions is kind of, um, probably with the amount of people we have in the room, two to three people per group would be good. Um, and just talk about with each other who you are first off, of course. But um, how do you most effectively engage with your community? What do you use? What is your top communication tool? And then what is your, if, if that's online, that's great. Um, but what, what is your top online tools? So we want kind of both of those things hand in hand. And then for your online engagement, what are your top two needs that you want to address here? So talk amongst yourself for about five minutes, and then we're going to kind of report back to the group and crowdsource your ideas. And you can turn around again. Yeah, you can turn around, figure out how to connect with each other. <laughs>